Welcome back to this wonderful celebration that it's, uh, it's our great privilege to host every year. And I just want to say on behalf of the Journalism School how uh, vital the, I, the uh, Cabot Awards are in the life of our school, increasingly so. You know, 40% of the graduate school uh, of the Columbia Journalism School 40% of our students now come from outside the United States. And every year, those of us on the faculty teach amazing journalists from Latin America uh, who are uh, not only uh, rising to the top of their field, but engaged already as young journalists in coverage of stories that uh, have real global importance and importance here in the United States. In addition to the, to the relationship we're developing with students from Latin America, we've also this year appointed a colleague of ours, uh, Ernest Sotomayor. Ernest, stand up for a second. Um, known to many of you. He is our new uh, director of Latin American initiatives, in addition to the many other hats he wears running student affairs at the school. He's traveling uh, systematically to Latin America to build partnerships to engage with employers and to connect the school more deeply to the region. Um, all this reflects something that you know better than perhaps some in this country, which is that our profession, journalism, is increasingly glo globalizing, the way finance did earlier, you know, the way uh, television did a little bit earlier. The profession of journalism, the aspirations of journalism in open societies and even in transitional and authoritarian societies is increasingly global in character. And so the opportunity to be engaged with Latin America through the thought leadership that these prizes represent, the talent that they honor, the, the convening that the judges uh, and the board uh, provide at Columbia is just uh, something we value enormously. And we'll, we'll hear tonight about how vital this work is in Latin America. We, honor bodies of work with these prizes, but they're connected to stories that are very much alive and very important, whether it's the Petrobras uh, scandal in Brazil or the mass murder of young men in Mexico. Uh, these are the stories of our time, and we're engaged with them through journalists who are doing just extraordinarily important work. And uh, one of those journalists is uh, going to join us now. It's my privilege to introduce her again this year, the chair of the Cabot Board, She's a past uh, Cabot Prize winner for investigative reporting and editor and editing at Semana, uh, Columbia's leading news magazine. And today, she's uh, the director of the journalism program at the Open Society Foundation's uh, London office, working globally to invest in investigative reporting and independent journalism in all sorts of, of societies. So please uh, join me in, rec in uh, welcoming back Maria Teresa Ronderos. Well, medalists and members of the Cabot family, President Bollinger, Dean Cole, colleagues and friends, thank you for being here with us to celebrate one of the oldest and most cherished traditions of journalism in the Americas, the Maria Morse Cabot Award Ceremony. I speak on behalf of the Cabot jury. They have commissioned me to tell you a bit about what this prize means for journalism in this continent about our work this year and about what journalism we are seeing from this privileged window. For over 70 years, being a recipient of the Cabot Medal has been an honor for journalists from New York to Los Angeles, from Sao Paulo to La Paz or Mexico City to Miami. It applauds a life career of excellence and it is the only one that seeks to promote great journalism as a means to better understanding of the Americas. Now, let me tell you about the jury's conclusions. Tonight, we are not celebrating the achievements of the best. When, when we, the jury, met last May to pick the winners after a couple of elimination rounds, we still had about 12 or 16 names on the board, all of them with outstanding careers. We had to select 
the very best, and it is the achievements of the best among the best that we are honoring tonight. Lucas, Raul, Simon, Mark, and Eduardo, with different styles and sensitivities through their reportages or interviews, their editing or their investigations, the body of work of these colleagues stands out for its quality, its independent thinking amidst government pressures, for its courageous reporting to unearth thorny truth, tr truths, for fair and balanced coverage despite political radicalization, and for its surprising discoveries of creativity and energy that undo prejudice and stereotypes of our countries and our people. Without their stories, the citizens of the Americas would surely be less well informed. It is true that these are hard times for journalism in the Americas. Journalists killed by criminals, independent media persecuted by autocrats, business models and great legacy media facing turmoil loud also in Latin America. Surveillance put sources at risk and public debate is some, sometimes distorted by pay, pay trolls and professional manipulators. However, so, so long as we have colleagues as committed to truth and fairness as the ones we are celebrating tonight, we can still be hopeful of the future of our profession in this continent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria Teresa. It's now my privilege to introduce the president of Columbia University who will preside over the Cabot Prizes. Lee Bollinger became Columbia's 19th president in 2002. He's a member of the Columbia Law School faculty and also one of the country's foremost First Amendment scholars. He comes from a family of journalists, which he doesn't always advertise, but we know. Uh, and he is a well-known defender of press freedoms. He's also been a wonderful ally and supporter of the journalism school, but I think most importantly of all, just an extraordinary leader in placing the defense of free expression at the heart of the agenda of Columbia University. So please join me in welcoming President Lee Bollinger. Thank you very much, uh, Steve. So, uh, this is an evening that um, I look forward to every year, but I uh, always feel the same way. That is, when I read about the recipients of the Cabot Medals, uh, and when I read the remarks uh, that have been prepared for me as sort of a briefing, uh, I am struck by the enormous uh, courage of uh, reporters and the press uh, throughout the Americas. Uh, I am really, really, um, uh, I have a deep uh, admiration for what you do. I think it's um, an incredible tribute to the institution of the press generally, and I think it's a tribute to uh, the academy, uh, which I'm a part, because I think all of us value the truth and pursuing the truth even uh, at the cost of personal risk. So it's a, it's a great honor for uh, me to be here. Uh, I just want to say very quickly before beginning to call up the uh, recipients, the medalists, uh, that at Columbia we have many people who are experts in uh, the Americas and we have many programs uh, and centers uh, devoted to the study and thinking uh, of this part of the world. Uh, the Journalism School uh, under Steve is a spectacular uh, school within the university. It, um, uh, it's, a, I think, an admirable uh, professional school for many reasons, but not least because it does this remarkable thing of being able to be academic and intellectual and so on, while also being very practical. Um, so I'm, I'm a great admirer of Steve and the school, as Steve said. But I also think the university has a, an obligation to try to be in this area of freedom of mind and thought and speech 
Uh, and because it's my own particular area, I have, um, in the First Amendment, I have tried to broaden that and become more global, uh, given the fact that we're in a global economy and a global communication system. And I just want you to know that we have set up in the past couple of years a global free expression uh, center project at Columbia. I hired Agnes Calamart from Article 19. And we're working at every level to try to advance international norms on freedom of speech and press. And the first thing we're trying to do is to build just the sense of the jurisprudence of free speech and free press around the world. And we now have a website that has 400 cases that are summarized uh, from around the world. This has not existed before, so that uh, you could look and see what's happening in Tunisia and what's happening in um, Chile and what's happening uh, elsewhere. And the other thing we're doing is actively now beginning to train judges um, about human rights and international norms and free expression in particular. And we have a project uh, with a number of um, uh, countries from Latin America. So we're onto that. And we're also having conferences, meetings. We have an award that we give every year now to the best judicial decision on freedom uh, of the press. And uh, so this is an ongoing thing. And I just want you to, to know about it. Um, shall we start with the um, awardees? So um, I think we invite you to um, come individually, correct? Not all at once to the stage. So the first is uh, Lucas Mendez. Please come to the podium. Our first medalist career embodies the core mission of these prizes, honoring journalists who make significant contributions to inter-American understanding. For almost five decades, Lucas Mendes has worked as a Brazilian correspondent in New York, explaining the North to the South. He is the creator, director, and host of the television news program, Manhattan Connection, on Global News, Brazil's first cable news channel, translating U.S. to Brazilians every week through analysis, commentary, and debate. In 1997, the program first covered allegations of corruption in the giant state oil company, Petrobras. When federal investigators revealed further allegations of wrongdoing at the highest levels of Petrobras in 2014, Mendez program was the only national television news outlet to cover the growing national scandal. He has been a role model for younger journalists in Brazil, providing insight into the country's long road of consolidating its democracy. Lucas Mendez, for your lifetime commitment to promoting an understanding of the Americas, the trustees of Columbia University are honored to present you with the Mariah Moore's Cabot Gold Medal. Congratulations. Thank you. Pray for me now, like Francis said. I'm sorry I have to correct something you said. We were the first one to, uh, in our program, to denounce that was high level of corruption at Petrobras. But in 2014, the Brazilian press was very good and very aggressive, and they have been doing an excellent job. It's, uh, they would, if they know, if they said that my was the only one <laughs> reporting that, I would, I would be killed the next weekend or tomorrow. But uh, thank you very much. Uh, in the spring of 1969, I was traveling by car through the south with a group of foreign journalists. Uh, we had visited the infamous bridge in Selma, Alabama, and we were going to interview Governor George Wallace. We had time for coffee, so we stopped, and the owner would not serve us because one of our guys 
was a black man from Ethiopia. He was the sweetest guy. He didn't seem to mind. The American director who was with us, he minded. White guy. And he was not very nice on when he complained. So the owner took a baseball bat from under the counter. And he had friends. It looked bad, just like in the movies. So our American friend ran out, called the governor, and in a few minutes, the cops were there and escorted us out. 45 years later, a black president was being served coffee at the White House. For me, this is one of the most powerful, positive, profound changes I have seen in my life. I have been a journalist for 49 years almost 40, 40 as a reporter. I have been lucky, and I managed to is, is stretch my journalistic career with a cable television program, writing columns for Brazilian papers and for BBC Brazil. In 1992, when the Global Group started the cable network, a director called me and said, Lucas, we want you to get five or six guys and produce something like 60 minutes. I said, wow, I was unemployed in New York, and I thought going from zero to 60 minutes to fantastic, just a few seconds. So I said, how much money do we have? And I don't remember the exact number. But when and I told her, listen, with this money, I can get maybe two, maybe three guys in a room, and we can talk about what we saw in 60 minutes. She left the room, called the boss, and they loved it. So this program started very quick, fast, no drama. We were getting uh, good ratings, and uh, mostly thanks to a, a very controversial veteran journalist called Paulo France, who, <laughs> who said things that normally we wouldn't say on television. But one day, he shocked everyone, shocked us, and he shocked Brazil because he said there was high level of corruption at the top of Petrobras. And he was specific, he said the president and seven directors got $50 million each in kickbacks and the money is in Switzerland. He would not reveal his source. Uh, Two months later, the president and the director sued him for $110 million here in New York. Francis was terrified. He thought his career was over, and he would be poor again, but it was worse than that. Two months later, I saw him dead in his apartment on the floor. He had a heart attack. Francis, in one way, was a prophet. Today, Petrobras is mired in the biggest scandal in Brazilian history, known as Lava Jato, or car wash. Today, our program is on Global News Network. It's our version of a 24-hour news uh, channel. And it's seen in 164 countries, including here at the, on the Time Warner cable. At 23, it's the oldest 
program, independent program on the Brazilian cable television. I want to express my gratitude to the Board of Columbia University Trustees and the Maria Morse Cabot Prizes for this award. A Latin American friend, Peruvian, called this the Oscar of journalism. And after 50 years of covering news, American news for Brazilians, almost 50 years. Uh, that's how I'm feeling right now. My time up here is ending, so please allow me to moment to roll some credits. First to my television family, Henderson Royce, Angelica Vieira, and almost 30 others behind the camera. They are all here. Plus Caio Blinder, Pedro Andrade, Ricardo Morin, and Diogo Mainardi in front of the cameras. We tape in New York, we have studios in Italy, uh, Sao Paulo and Rio, so the guys came from different places. It, it's an interesting program. And my family. Paulo, my oldest son, is a writer and is working on a script with my younger son, Antonio, a movie director. Francesca is the smart one. She got into business. And Rose Ganguza, my wife of 35 years, uh, she has been directing and scripting my life. And she graduated from here, she, uh, from SIPA. But she became a movie producer. And what are the odds? One of the greatest, one of the best scenes in her last movie called Kill Your Darlings was shot in this building three years ago. And here am I accepting an Oscar. Being awarded the Maria Morse Cabot is the biggest honor in my professional life. Thank you very much. Raul, Penyaranda, please come to the podium. Penyaranda is one of the most accomplished journalists in Bolivia today. He has been a successful media entrepreneur, an innovator, an outstanding editor and analyst, a prolific book writer, and a voice of reason. He has launched three successful independent media outlets. His latest he designed while he was a Neiman Fellow at Harvard University and features an innovative business plan financing iPads to readers in order to build its audience. His strong stance against the abuse of power and media concentration by Bolivian President Morales, has earned him relentless persecution by the government, which considers him a traitor and a spy. Despite this, Peñaranda continues to write his columns and articles as an editorial writer and editor of the International Sunday edition of the paper he founded. Raul Peñaranda, for your commitment to explaining Latin America to your readers and your dedication to journalism, the trustees of Columbia University are honored to present you with the Mariah Moore's Cabot Gold Medal. Congratulations. Good evening. Lucas Mendes is a very good improviser. He's a TV journalist, so he can speak 
like he, he did, he just did, but I'm not, so I will, if you allow me, I will read my, my speech. I want to sincerely thank the Columbia University for granting me this prize. I feel honored and proud to receive it. I want to tell you that I'm only the third Bolivian reporter to receive the award, following two distinguished personalities of journalism and politics, Guillermo Gutierrez Beamurguia in the 60s and Huáscar Cajillas in the 90s. So first, I'd like to ask all to remember those two masters who won this prize before me. I want to thank my family also, my children who are in Bolivia, and my parents and my wife Fatima who are here tonight. I am blessed in having that extraordinary family. Without the support of my wife Fatima, who understands my crazy schedules, my stress, and my obsession for this job, I would not be standing here receiving this prize. Gracias, Fatima. As I prepared myself to write this speech, I searched among my notes to give some personal ideas about what journalism should be, a job related to bringing the public relevant, well-written, balanced, and fair stories. I might have spoken to you about the need that the press should help in pacifying highly polarized societies, yet insisting also in the need to build fairer societies. I might have mentioned how important it is for the press to be more inclusive in cases of multi-ethnic countries, which should begin in the newsrooms themselves. I may have been interested also in addressing the great challenge that the internet poses for our industry, even in countries of lesser economic development like mine. But all that sounds now academic and superficial. In Bolivia today, we press, the press faces other challenges much more basic and urgent. The existence of independent press itself is under threat. The government has developed a campaign to control the media. To do that, it has used several methods, like purchasing media outlets through businessmen allied to the president administration. He also harasses critical media outlets through verbal attacks, advertising boycotts, labor inspections, and illegal tax audits. He has also co-opted most media outlets through millionaire contracts for government advertisement. The result has been, has been perfect for the government. This silent campaign has been so successful that only a few of press outlets may consider themselves independent and critical. The richness of the old Bolivian media is unfortunately something of the past. In Bolivia, we are confirming the facts that we read in textbooks, that freedom of speech and freedom of the press are at the center of all democratic freedoms. You cannot help an activist who has been illegally imprisoned if there's no reporter who reveals such irregularity. There's no way of freeing someone detained for his political views if the media do not pressure authorities for his release. There's no battle against corruption if a daily doesn't investigate and reveal the facts. Those of us in Bolivia who have made the improvement of our de democracy our greatest priority verify today that the weakness of the media explains all other difficulties of our young democracy. I second the opinion of Spanish novelist and journalist Arturo Perez Reverte. In my opinion, he said, the only restriction that politicians, bankers, and the powerful encounter when they reach perverse amounts of influence is fear of free press, fear of public exposure, fear of making headlines. In Bolivia, this fear is fading. Yet, in my home country, there are still a handful of outstanding journalists, brave and reliable, who continue to make this job something relevant and meaningful. Although the Cabot jury hasn't mentioned this, I am convinced that by granting this prize to me, it's also rewarding all of them as well. Thank you very much.
Simone Romero, please come to the podium. As the Brazil bureau chief for the New York Times, Simone Romero has chronicled Latin America from its remote corners to its centers of global influence, delivering an extraordinary range of news exclusives as well as insightful portraits of the region which broaden and challenge our concepts of the hemisphere as a whole. Starting in Brazil in 1995 as a reporter for Bloomberg News, he began documenting a political culture of impunity that allowed leaders to steal and reward themselves lavishly. As a former Andean bureau chief for the New York Times, he vividly described life in Venezuela during the rise and demise of Hugo Chavez, while also covering human rights abuses in Colombia's long internal war. Born and raised in New Mexico, Romero's fascination with Latin America was nurtured as a student at Harvard University and the University of Sao Paulo. Simone Romero, for your commitment to explaining Latin America to readers in the United States, the trustees of Columbia University are honored to present you with the Mariah Moore's Cabot Gold Medal. Congratulations. Wow, <laughs> it's pretty incredible to be here. Uh, I am truly honored to be here tonight, thank you. Uh, I wanna start by expressing my gratitude to Columbia University, uh, the entire Cabot jury, and of course to my editors, especially Greg Winter at the New York Times. They are the ones who have pushed me and cajoled me and consistently indulged in my passion for ranging all over such a fascinating region. Uh, our shared enchantment with Latin America, after all, is what brings us together in this cherished place tonight. Um, and I'd like to focus on one thing here, which is the importance of being there. We did a fascinating experiment at the Times this month, compiling all the different datelines from all our correspondents around the world. Uh, the results were astounding uh, when we put them on a map. Places in Greenland, Mongolia, Myanmar, deep inside war-torn Yemen. There were even a few scattered dots around the Amazon rainforest, uh, a vast expanse that has lured me back time and again for well over a decade. Um, I had kind of an unusual route to getting to such places as a foreign correspondent. It started, I guess, with some crazy choices that my parents made before I was even born when they decided to live off the grid in rural New Mexico. Uh, both my mom and my dad were well educated. They had met in graduate school, but they simply thought that was an interesting way to raise a family. Uh, and, and well into elementary school, we didn't have running water or electricity. But what we lacked in creature comforts, we gained in exposure to a place of stunning beauty and enduring cultural resilience. Uh, my parents always found a way to give me and my sister books on just about any subject. They always read the newspaper, usually the Las Vegas Daily Optic, Las Vegas, New Mexico. Uh, the, the Sunday New York Times was a treat to be savored, even if it was a few days old. And my mom, curiously, uh, grew up here in New York, and they're back on the grid now. But she still jokes with me that the best training for going into international journalism was attending public school in New Mexico. Um, in, in this age of social media, uh, sometimes it seems like the world is 
becoming a much smaller place and getting much more interconnected with people exchanging easily their impressions of the distant places they visit on Instagram or Snapchat. It might even seem like journalists are no longer needed given the never-ending timeline of information coming from remote corners of the world. But I beg to differ. <laughs> Nothing can replace the act of getting up from your desk, getting into a plane or a car or a boat or riding a horse or even walking on foot and getting to the scene of a story. Sometimes that means talking to local journalists, working together, sharing sources, a process of cross-pollination which enriches our reporting. My fellow honoree tonight, Raúl Peñaranda, helped me immensely when I would land in La Paz attempting to decipher Bolivian politics while grappling with altitude sickness in the shadow of the Andes. In my own experience, there's nothing comparable to entering lands controlled by rebel groups like the FARC or talking my way into a Venezuelan prison. You, you just can't write that kind of story in an office somewhere. At a time when news gathering, news gathering budgets are growing more limited, there's a hunger for such reporting gathered on the ground. I like to think this has to do with a basic need among us for exploration, for stories about the human experience. One of the most amazing moments I've had as a journalist involved this realization in the Serra da Capivara in Northeast Brazil, in Piauí. It took forever to get there. On roads winding through arid thorn forests, we, we scaled escarpments under the blistering sun to reach caves where some of the first people in the Americas once lived more than 9,000 years ago. Their paintings in red ochre on the walls of the caves were of hunting scenes, huge animals, even some revelry. These were stories in their own way. I wondered what their datelines might have been. In closing, I would like to dedicate this prize to my family. Uh, my wife, Carolina, came with me all the way from Brazil to be here. She made this possible. Our sons, Lucas and Tomas, are already incredibly curious explorers in their own right. And finally, I would like to salute all of the previous winners of this prize, those of you who are with us here tonight, and those who are very far away. We walk in your footsteps, attempting to live up to your legacy. Muito obrigado. Muchísimas gracias. Mark Stevenson, please come to the podium. Mark Stevenson has been a Mexico-based reporter for the Associated Press since 1997 and has covered stories from Central America, Haiti, Cuba, Cuba and Venezuela. Born in upstate New York and trained in linguistics, Stevenson has covered the major drug cartel conflicts in Mexico over two decades, focusing much of his coverage on the effects of the drug war on ordinary citizens, the economy, and human rights. 
His stories helped expose the extent of cartel control over the people and economy of a Western state, Mexico, and the vigilante movement that arose in 2013 to fight the gangs. His most recent series of stories exposed the killings of 22 criminal suspects carried out in 2014 by a Mexican army patrol, after most had surrendered or were disarmed. That led to human rights investigations and charges against more than a dozen people accused of carrying out the crime or trying to cover it up. Mark Stevenson, for your years of commitment to promoting the, an understanding of Latin America and the United States, the trustees of Columbia University are honored to present you with the Mariah Moore's Gold Cabot Gold Medal. Congratulations. Thank you very much. I think this award says a lot. It says two things, not about me, but about our industry. The story he just described, we were able to do because we were able to go to the scene of the massacre. And that's not something that was safe. We saw cartel gunmen there in town. But it shows you that it's a very different thing to say something's dangerous as a foreign correspondent than it is for a Mexican reporter to say something looks dangerous. <laughs> of all the 64 journalists killed in Mexico since 2000, all of them have been Mexican. None of us have been foreign correspondents. The Mexican press has made great strides in the last 10 years in their ability and their professionalism, but they can't do their job if they're afraid of being killed. And because of that, I would like to donate the prize money that you have so generously given me to the Committee to Protect Journalists. And just as importantly, we were able to go down there because we have editors at AP, one of us, one of whom is present tonight, Marjorie Miller, who had the interest, the passion for the news, and the confidence in her reporters to send us down there, even though we couldn't guarantee a story when we came back. In the era of cutbacks, and budget cuts at media outlets, that's going to be become more and more rare. And for that reason, I think initiatives like Columbia University's program in investigative journalism is so important. And believe me, if I had more prize money, I would donate it to them. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Ernesto Londano, please come to the podium. In addition to the gold medals for lifetime achievement, the Cabot jury also searches for journalistic accomplishments in the past year that have had an extraordinary impact on the region. Such was the case with a remarkable series of editorials by the New York Times on Cuba. The editorials built a compelling factual and political case for the United States to end its 50-year-old policy of confrontation. 
published simultaneously in Spanish and English. The editorials argued forcefully that engagement would promote the transformation of Cuba into a more open and prosperous society, and that it would invigorate independent journalism. The editorials were written by a young member of the editorial board, Ernesto Londono. They tackled all the controversial aspects of US-Cuba policy, which had languished in political stalemate for decades. Thus, the editorials seemed prescient when the Obama administration announced bold changes last December, opening the way for the normalization of relations. They acted as a powerful force in shaping and informing public opinion in both the United States and Latin America. And that is what editorial leadership is all about. Ernesto Londono, the trustees of Columbia University, are honored to present you with a special Mariah Moore's Cabot citation for your remarkable and impactful editorial work on Cuba. Congratulations. Good evening. Thank you so much, President Bollinger, Dean Cole, and Chairwoman Ronderos. Uh, it's an absolute pressure, pleasure to be here to accept this recognition on behalf of the editorial section of the New York Times. Um, I'd like to start out by thanking and acknowledging Andy Rosenthal and Terry Tang, the editors of the editorial page, who uh, shared my enthusiasm and at times obsession with Cuba last year when we decided that it was a good idea to go big and go loud on Cuba policy. I became interested in American policy toward Cuba many years ago when I was a college student and had an opportunity to visit the island. It's a very confusing place. I was mesmerized by it. It seems improbably locked in time. The architecture, much of which is crumbling, is absolutely beautiful, and everywhere you go, you feel like music is following you. The final image of that trip, for me, was a searing one. There is a spot at the airport in Havana where the people who are leaving have to say their final goodbye to the people who are being left behind. And these were no ordinary farewells. These were really wrenching final embraces that were drenched in tears and parting words that seemed impossibly painful. At the time, leaving Cuba was a final wrenching choice. There was really no going back and forth. That image from that morning weighed heavily on me last year when we set out to write about Cuba. And in doing so, we initially only uh, aspired to write one editorial making what seemed like a pretty basic request that the Obama administration consider reestablishing diplomatic relations with Cuba. Unbeknownst to us, this effort was well underway. However, at the time, this was secret. But it soon became clear to us that we were in a really good position to shape a very complicated debate and one that to this day continues to stir very strong passions. In writing about Cuba, we tried to focus on the people who stood to benefit the most from engagement. And I like to think that in doing so, we built a compelling case. Um, in the past few months, I think we've started to see some of the early signs that engaging with Cuba holds a much more promise for ordinary Cubans than a punitive policy. People continue to leave Cuba pretty much every week for much of the same reasons that drove them to flee more than a decade ago when I was there. But it gives me some solace to know that those farewells at the airport are no longer as painful. They're no longer as crushing. They need not be. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much to all and good night.